talking to those little black boxes on Zoom with names on them. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Lucas, Managing Editor for The Knitting Circle, and welcome to this month's Q&A. Uh, we use this time each month just to chat about our favorite subject of knitting and to answer any of your questions. And today I have a really great guest with me. Um, but before I get to my guest, I just want to talk about a couple of little housekeeping things real quick. First of all, no matter where you're watching this, Facebook, YouTube, our website, you will see either a comment section or a chat box, and you can use that to say hello and ask your questions, and we will get to as many questions as we can in the next hour. And then also, you will find um, in the comments or chat box a link to this month's free pattern. And the free pattern this month is the Waffle Stitch Infinity Scarf, which I have right here. It's um, a big, long cowl that is super beginner friendly and it's totally free. So make sure that you go ahead and click the link to get that download. So now I'd like to introduce you to our guest this month. Michelle Lee Bernstein is a knitting instructor and designer. She's a contributing editor for The Knitting Circle and she's done a lot of great videos for us and written a lot of interesting articles. And I'm so excited that she's here to chat with us today and answer all your questions. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. Someday I'm going to see you in person again. But I know. I know. Cool now. Yes, Michelle and I have known each other for a long time, but we sort of live uh, very far apart from each other. So yes, <laughs> hopefully we'll reunite soon. <laughs> um, so while I'm uh, starting to get some questions into the chat box, I was wondering if you could go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about how you started knitting and then maybe also how you made that leap from being a knitter to being a knitting designer and instructor. I learned to knit when I was 14 and my favorite Aunt Rose taught me how to knit. She turned 80 yesterday, it's her birthday, so I'm very excited to have sent a little message to her including this little knit piece behind me. Um, I have always messed around with my knitwear and accessories. It's like, I, I like this on, when I was sewing my clothes, I like this skirt and this top on this dress. And I want to put that together and change the collar. And then I would make it uniquely my own. And for knitting, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, I have this idea and this idea and this idea. How can I put all those things together to make what I want? So I've been knitting a long time, but when Ravelry started, I've, found that there was a way to actually have a place to self-publish my patterns. And that was really exciting to me. So that's when I started designing for real. And not too long after that, the local knit shop asked me if I wanted to teach for them. And I did. And I found out that I really love it. So I love teaching and designing pretty much in equal measure. I like designing accessories because my three favorite words are gauge not critical, you wrap these things on yourself. They don't have to fit a particular way. And it's pretty accessible for a lot of people. I really like that. Yeah, I agree. You and I are kind of this kind of got started the same way too is yeah, I was always kind of doing my own thing. And then yes, once it became easier to self publish your patterns on the internet, that really opened the doors, I think, for a lot of us too. And like you, I, I like things that gauge not critical, which is why I designed so many shawls, and I'm sure you do too. <laughs> I do too. Yep. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get into a couple of questions that we have. And the first one is from another Michelle. And her question is, preventing ladders while knitting magic loop. Any suggestions? I haven't had an issue with it in magic loop. I have had it with DPNs. But I know that if you try something called traveling magic loop and you're going to have to google for it because i only saw this recently mm -hmm. but you finish your needle and then you pull out a little bit after those last three stitches and that brings your knitting around onto the fronts of the needles again and the loose part is not going to be there or you could just knit a few extra stitches as you go much like you do with double pointed needles so you finish a needle and then you knit a few more stitches and that just keeps moving that point around that's well, a really good suggestion I never thought, yeah i never good. thought of that before yeah the traveling loop is really cool and i actually use that sometimes when um, i'm knitting a hat and i'm too lazy to go get um double pointed needles when it's like 
you know, when I'm decreasing. So like, I'll just start, yeah, like pulling out a little bit of the cord and kind of moving it around as I go. The other thing I do when I'm knitting magic loop is I have a tendency to tighten down a little bit on the first and second stitches. Um, yeah. That seems to help me a little bit too. But yeah, if you're having problems, you could try, especially if you're doing something like a plain sock or a plain hat, you can kind of make those loops travel to different places. So it's kind of spreading out that tension, I guess. I know um, if you're doing color work, it's kind of funny because it's hard to get that color from a couple stitches before the end of the needle all the way over. So making your loop travel for that is really good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, great. And then now we have a question from Amy. Uh, Amy is brand new to knitting. So, um, oh, she actually has two questions. The first one is, what advice do you have for how to get consistency with your tension? Is it just practice, practice, practice? It is just practice, practice, mm -hmm. practice. It yeah. doesn't really matter if you're a continental knitter or if you're an English style thrower, if you wind it around your finger or if you hold your finger up, the more you do it, the better it's going to be. Yeah, I agree. And I always tell people, everybody really knits a little bit different. Everybody holds their yarn a little different. You just need to figure out what works for you and then be consistent in the way that you're holding the yarn. And yes, definitely practice. Um, and pretty much whatever tension you're getting, if you're liking the fabric, that's the right tension for you. Um, and if you have to change needle sizes when you're knitting some, you know, following a pattern, that's totally fine. I have to do that all the time when I'm knitting other people's patterns because I'm kind of a loose knitter. So yeah, it's just really about being consistent. And then, um, I mean, if you're knitting it so tight that your fabric is bulletproof, then yes, maybe change how you're doing your tension. Um, but otherwise, yes, just absolutely practice. Um, and then Amy's other question is, what is the difference between bamboo and metal needles? It's personal preference. What do you like? And so I want you to try all of them and see what you like knitting with. Sometimes it depends what you're knitting too, the kind of fiber that you're using. So I like slick metal needles for some fibers, but I like something a little grippier like ebony or rosewood for something that is, it just needs a little bit of stickiness to keep it from running away from me. I, you also want to check the different kinds of points because some needles have pointier tips than others. I like mine a little bit blunt, not super sharp, but I don't like them so blunt that I'm not feeling like I can get into my stitch. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's really just the bamboos made of bamboo, metals made of metal. And then, yeah, absolutely what Michelle said, just the, sometimes with the different yarns, um, you're going to find that you like one over the other. Um, and you can find both kinds very inexpensively at the, you know, big box craft stores or big, you know, sort of warehouse stores. Um, you can spend a lot of money on knitting needles, but you don't have to. You can find them for pretty inexpensive. Here's um, a tip, though. If you swatch with bamboo needles, you should knit your project on bamboo needles. And the same is true with metal. You want to use the same material in your needles for your swatch as you do in your real project because it can change. Your gauge can change. Absolutely. That's a very, very good tip. Very good tip. Let's see here. Let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, so, oh, Michelle, going back to Michelle's original question about the, um, preventing ladders with magic loop. She's saying at armhole sock gussets, there are holes and she's looking for preventative measures. So I think like now she's talking about like if she's doing magic loop and maybe she's getting, um, ladders, um, yeah. Like when she's doing the sock gusset to me, I would almost, if you're getting a ladder there, I'd almost maybe just pick up an extra stitch and then decrease it away. What do you think, Michelle? I always pick up an extra stitch right there in the corner and mm -hmm. decrease it away on the next, on the next round. Yeah. Sometimes I'll pick up two even on a sock if it like, I don't know if the gap's really big or it's not looking good. I mean, yeah, it's one of those things where it's just as you knit more, you start to get a feel sort of for um, like when you need to do that kind of thing, if you need to pick up a stitch or not, because not, um, you know, not every pattern, like sock pattern is going to necessarily tell you to do that. Right. Um, hey, Jen, when mm -hmm. you pick up for your gusset on your socks, do you mm -hmm. pick up through the back loop of that stitch or do you pick up through the front? Do you put a little twist in it or no? I do put a twist in it, yeah. I do too, because I don't like big gappy holes along the edge of my gusset. 
yeah, I like it. I liked it. Yeah, to look nice and tight. <laughs> you, you are my pal here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, let's see. I don't see any other questions just yet. So I'm going to ask you a question while we're waiting for more questions. So, um, you know, we were talking at the beginning about how you like to um, design a lot of shawls. Do you have a favorite shawl shape? Maybe what is your favorite shawl shape and why? I like several of them. I like the sideways one that grows out and then comes back in. And I don't do the regular triangular one very often. Sometimes I'll do the extended wing one. Mm -hmm. The one that I've been using most recently is the half pie shawl. I really like it. It's a half circle. Um, you could make a whole circle. You could make a pie shawl, but people always fold those and have to wear them. And I don't want to do all the knitting of the part that nobody's going to see. So I have pie shawl is perfect and it uses less yarn and you're done faster because, you know, I don't know about you, but when I'm about halfway done with anything, I start thinking about the next big thing that I want to do. Yep. Um, <laughs> but the great thing about a half pie shawl is that the increases come at different intervals. So you'll increase and then you'll increase when it's twice as long as that. And then again, and, again. and it's a very, um, forgiving but helpful formula. So you're not increasing every row or every other row. And that way you don't have to keep checking your stitch count to make sure that, did I remember to increase? Did I forget to increase? I love it. Yeah, me too. I love those half pie shawls so much. There's so, there's, yeah. And I do, and from a design standpoint, it is nice because you can figure out your patterns that you want to put in between. You don't have to worry about the increases or anything. Um, and Michelle really does have some really great videos and articles on the knitting circle about some half pie shawls. So if you're interested, um, in learning about half pie shawls, then definitely go check out some of those, uh, videos. Oh, um, Andrea says that half pie is my go-to. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I love that one too. Right yeah. Here. yeah. <laughs> We're in the half pie shawl club. Yeah. I do like full pie shawls. Like I do like the fact that you just kind of knit them in the round, but yeah, I agree. Like then they're, for me, they're kind of difficult to wear. I've, I've long wanted to explore making a pie shawl with armholes in it, but I have not quite got, <laughs> quite gotten there yet. So, so would like you, I'm just curious how you would, handle those armholes. Okay. I'm going to, I'm just going to watch you and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I like drew it out and kind of did some math once and then I got scared. So I didn't, <laughs> I did not make the shawl with the, with the armholes. Cause the, I think the tricky part is that, you know, people's back, like back with measurement obviously is different for every yeah. body. And so it's almost like, yes, it's a pie shawl, but you also have to like accommodate for the fact that it's kind of like a sweater or a vest where you have to make sure that that back measurement's correct for the armholes. And now it has to fit. <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. Now it has to fit. So now you have to do a gay swatch. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, do you have any more questions in here? Let's see. I'm not seeing any just yet. So the other thing I know that you really like to do are the those uh, log cabin squares. Could you tell me a little bit about how you got into making those in the first place? <laughs> so it all started, and I'm just going to grab it. It's right over here. It started with a blanket, and this was supposed to be what I was going to use to use all of my leftover worsted weight yarn. And this is a pattern in the Mason Dixon knitting book, the first one. And it's just, oh, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a big blanket oh. and it's awesome. And you know, the warm colors are over here and the cool colors are over here. Well, of course I ran out of scraps and I had to order more yarn. So the saving by using my scrap yarn really wasn't such a thing that was going to happen. And then when I finished it, I had more scrap yarn, but it's okay. So it started here. And then I started thinking of all the ways you could use it just to frame things. Hang on. So I did this pillow and I don't, there, get close enough that, that doesn't get blown out, but it's got oh, yeah. this tree on one side and it's got some more trees on the other side, but it's got a log cabin frame. And I think it looks really great when you frame things. Most recently, I have this shawl behind me. I want to show you this because it's so much fun. So 
So this starts in the middle with oh. a leafy center that's knit in the round. I love leaves. I love nature. It shows up a lot. And then I went around it log cabin style to make a frame. And then I just worked one end out and the other end out. This thing is enormous because I wanted to see what would happen if I used all my yarn. So it's 98 wow. inches. You really don't have to make it this wide. <laughs> I just wanted to see what would happen. That is really cool. I really like that. What a cool, what an innovative way to use the log cabin technique. That's awesome. So, I love it. You can't really go around and around after you get past that center because then it would get wider and I don't want it to be wider. I don't want to wear a blanket, right. but I really like this and, you know, I could do a better job if I had a mirror to put it on with, but mm -hmm. it's just really cozy. It's fingering weight yarn, free colors, really happy. Yeah. So log cabins are on my mind right now. I just did a design submission that used the frame mm -hmm. and it also used mitered squares. And I can't tell you much more about it yet because I need to hear back and find out what's mm -hmm. going on with it before anything else happens. But yeah. oh. mitered squares and log cabins are on my mind right now. Yeah. Yeah. And after you, um, after you did your videos for the knitting circle, um, I went on a log cabin kick. I like got all of my leftover sock yarn for which there is a ton in my house and just started just at night. I just was like knitting log cabin squares that I'll eventually put together into a blanket. But man, I had not done it before. And watching your video about it on the, on the knitting circle, I'm like, I need to do this right now. I'm getting <laughs> and, to you. So did yeah. you do it single or did you double it and call it worsted weight? No, I just, I just held the yarn single and just did fingering weight. Um, and did you go around and around and around and yeah, around? Yeah, I was going point? around and around and around. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the other thing you can do is make squares individual and then sew them all together later. But you don't really have any finishing besides sewing in the ends if you just keep going around and around and around. Yeah. And, and there's like, yeah. And I love that you can kind of like, you know, I mean, you're showing us with the shawl, you can make all different kinds of shapes and different things with a log cabin. It doesn't just have to be a square, you know, cause you can make it a rectangle, whatever. Yeah. It's really cool. Yes. Um, okay. Let's see. We have a question from Donna and she asks, I'm going to try my first top down sweater. Do you have any suggestions about that style of pattern? Um, what do you think, Michelle? I don't design sweaters, but I have knit several top down sweaters. And I really like them. Um, I know that I, that you can try it on as you go. So after you get down to the armhole, you'll want to put half the stitches on one really long needle and half on another, or you can put it on waist yarn and you can put it on and you can see if it's going to fit and if you like it. So many times when I've knit in the other direction, I'll be finished and it's like, oh, too long, too short. And I've got to take it down because I've got to readjust the armhole. And top down is my favorite right now. I have Free love notes by Tin Can Knits. <laughs> mm -hmm. I might make one more just because they're really great for teaching. You can wear them and, you know, you only have to look good from the waist up on Zoom, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, So the, that pattern from Tin Can Knits, you said it's called Love Notes. Love Notes. Um, is that a top-down raglan sweater? Yes. Yeah. Although I don't know if it's raglan, but it's definitely top-down and top down. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking too, cause I think that I was going to think of, I was thinking of tin can knits to the flax sweater. I'm pretty sure that one's a top down sweater too. And I know that a lot of people start with that one as like their first sort of try at sweater knitting. And I believe that there is a free version of it. If you just Google tin can knits, you, I think their website is tin can knits.com. So, um, yeah, but yeah, like, Definitely top-down sweaters, I think, are the way to go when you're starting your sweater knitting journey, especially, like, if you are doing the top-down raglan, you don't have to, like, fit a bunch of, you know, like, sleeves into your pieces and stuff. It makes it a little bit yes. easier on your first Finish try. It's a lot easier. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> oh, here's a uh, hint. You might, you might cast on the neck provisionally mm -hmm. and then work down and then decide what you want to do with the neck. Mm. I did that. I don't know if that was part of it or not, but it made it so that one of them I could pick it off and put it back on my needle and just make a little rolled neck. Oh, and okay. the other ones I did a ribbing, but that way 
I didn't have to decide right away because I don't like necklines that come up high on me. I'm just kind of yeah. claustrophobic. Yeah, I'm kind of the same too. That's a really great tip. Um, okay, so we have another question, but before we get to our next question, I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have a uh, free pattern for you to download this month. Um, it is the Waffle Stitch Infinity Scarf, which I have right here. So if you want to get that pattern, you can um, find a link um, on the page where you're watching the video. Um, okay, so now let's see. We have a question from Carly. She says, I made a square baby blanket for my nephew and it looks great, but one corner goes a little long and odd shaped, like it's a little bit longer. What went wrong? So it was square, but it ended up not square. I guess was it a mind square or was it just a square? It sounds like it just was a baby blanket that was like all in one piece that should have been square, but then one side's a little long and odd shaped. To me, that sounds like maybe some extra stitches or something got on the needle on one side. I don't know. Or have you washed it and laid it out to dry and just patted it into the square shape that you're looking for? That's a good idea. That's true. Because if you're. Magic. <laughs> yeah, blocking is magic. Yeah. So if you have not. Um, washed it or blocked it yet that might that could even help even if it if some one side did come out a little wonky because something got messed up while you were knitting it um, blocking can sort of hide not everything but a lot of things um, it does. and I'm not talking about blocking in a big way where you're stretching it out on yeah. wires and everything this is just wetting it squeezing the water out roll it up in a towel walk all over it so extra water comes out and they then lay it out flat to dry and make sure your corners are where you want them. Yeah. Yeah. That could really help too. Um, yeah, for sure. That's a really good tip. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes, you know, when you're knitting, you just some, sometimes you just accidentally add a few extra stitches and depending on the stitch pattern, sometimes you, you know, don't even notice that that's happened, but yeah, maybe if you could, uh, try, like Michelle said, blocking it, that could definitely help. We do have a blocking video that Michelle did. Um, it's more for blocking shawls. So like fully stretching out and like pinning out your piece. But if you're interested in learning more about blocking, um, we do have a video for that on the knitting circle. Um, August, August asks, what's a good beginner project for getting into garment items? Um, things like small socks with the tiny needles and yarn make me nervous. So I don't know, maybe the top down sweater would be a good place to start. Yeah. And you know that I don't know about flax, but the love note sweater, you can either do fingering with a, a strand of mohair along with it or else DK weight yarn. And it's knitted a really loose gauge. So I think mm -hmm. it was on sixes and nines. Mm -hmm. it, it's not tiny. I, I don't really love tiny needle knitting. I don't really knit very many socks. You know, I knit worsted weights. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I like big yarn, big needles, or yeah. small yarn, big needles for shawls. And that gives it drape and flow and, and laciness. Yeah, I was going to say too, yeah, like, like you said, with worsted weight socks, if you do want to knit socks, but you don't want to knit them with the tiny yarn and the tiny needles, um, you can definitely knit yourself a pair of worsted weight socks. Um, you know, I live in Illinois, so I would wear those socks in my boots in the winter or, you know, then just around the house. I wouldn't necessarily like a worsted weight sock for me doesn't really like fit in like a standard shoe. Um, right. you know, it's really thick, but you know, for your boots in the winter, um, you know, I used to have a job where I worked outside, so I did wear them outside in my boots, but, um, yeah. Or even if you're just trying to find something that, has a little bit of shaping if you're if you are a beginner and maybe you know like you just want to try something with shaping before you go into sweaters things like hats are really great um mittens or fingerless mitts could be really great yeah oh wait show us that hat what you got there <laughs> this is a brioche hat mm, yeah and it's really squishy there's also a cowl also really squishy mm -hmm. um in the last year, I've done a lot of designing that revolves around teaching because there are certain things I want to teach in a certain way. And so I'll think, well, how can I teach increases and decreases and get it all kind of at the beginning of class so we have time to practice it? And that's how 
honestly, this came about. And then I, someone said, I don't really wear cows. Are you ever going to make that into a hat? Oh, sure. I can do that for you. I want you to see the top of this. I love the top of this hat. It's so Oh yeah, cool. that is really cool. Um, so here's what I'm wondering, because you do so many things with like cool techniques, like brioche, you use a lot of specialty stitches in your shawls, I know. Um, is that just something you enjoy? Do you get like, you just really like them? Do you make them up the patterns up? Do you look at stitch dictionaries? Sort of where do you get your inspiration for all that stuff? That cool stuff? It depends. That you do? <laughs> it depends. Um, sometimes I get inspiration from nature. And I, you know, like I saw a time lapse photo of the sky, and I decided I needed to knit that. And so you know, the concentric circles, but of course I did a half pie shawl because I didn't want to knit the other half of the shawl. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is, but there's a stitch on it. She's wearing all my old clothes. <laughs> um, this is one color pro. So this is slip stitch knitting, these lines here. And then this star pattern, I had a flower stitch pattern that I learned somewhere, but I didn't want a flower and I needed to turn it inside out so it could start from the back side, so it would finish the way I wanted it to. And so, yes, I, I do make up my own stitches sometimes to get the effect that I want. But you'll see that there's only like three rows of that on here. Yeah. So even though it's kind of a little bit fussy, everything else about that shawl is super simple. And I like using just a little bit of some special stitch or technique to make it really pretty, but I also want it to be simple enough that I don't have to keep looking at the instructions when I'm knitting because I like to read or watch TV or whatever while I'm knitting or have knit night and chat with people. So I don't, I don't like the kind of knitting where you just have to be stuck to the instructions. Yeah, I got you. That's awesome. Yeah. I just love looking at all your shawl patterns because you always just have these cool stitches that in them that just, they, I don't know, it's just, there's, it just makes your shawls just so, so special and unique. I really love that. Um, Thank you. I really love that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any, um, like one technique, like, do you feel if you could only pick like one type of stitch or technique that you, um, could do like you could only pick one thing to do for the rest of the time that you knit is there like one thing that stands out as like your total favorite like oh I could just knit whatever for the rest of the time I'm knitting and I'd be cool <laughs> I bet it would be brioche mm -hmm. I I learned brioche in 2017 and I really fell in love with it I did fail to learn brioche before that a couple times and then finally got it sorted out and I like teaching people brioche because I start with two color brioche on the round. I think that's the simplest way to learn. And then we add increases and decreases in the next thing. And then we learn how to do it flat and we syncopate it. But there are so many things that I have not yet done with it that I think I could do that for a long time. It's pretty much sucked up my brain since 2017. Every once in a while I get a log cabin or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> but mostly brioche. Yeah, I have not really, I have not really explored brioche yet, but uh, it's something I should really try. It's so pretty. Every time I see anything brioche on the internet, Instagram, wherever, I'm like, ah, I want to knit that. But yeah, it's something I haven't really explored yet. I should give it a try. I should watch your videos okay. on the knitting circle. Yes. Do yes. I have a brioche video or do I have a brioche? I think I have a brioche blog post, but I don't know if I have a video. Yeah, you, I think you might have a video on fixing brioche stitches. I know we do have some, we do have some brioche videos on, um, on the website. Yes. Maybe, maybe you didn't do them, but so, there are some brioche videos. I did um, one yes. about the a mistake way down there. I remember yeah. it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. But if you want to learn brioche, if you go to my website, pdxknitterati.com, and you look down the side where all this stuff is, all the patterns, there's a free pattern called Petite Brioche. I want you to do it. It's just a two-color brioche headband, mm -hmm. and there are linked videos that you just click right through the pattern. I think you should learn brioche this year. Yeah, I'll I think I should. Make a cheerleader. Okay. Brioche in 2021 for me. Great. Yes. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Joan would like to know, how do you come up with your patterns? I can only follow patterns step by step and I wish I was more creative. So could you tell us a little bit about maybe your, how you come up with patterns, a little bit about your design process, how you go from idea to pattern on the internet? 
let me think about that. So I design, I, I remember saying this before, I design by trial and error. Mm -hmm. So I have an idea and it might revolve around a stitch pattern. It usually resolves, revolves around a sneaker, a stitch pattern. It doesn't usually start with, oh, this, this yarn is telling me this. No, I start at the other end. So some people collect yarn, I collect books. Mm -hmm. Look at my stitch dictionaries and think, I wanna use this and I wanna use this. And then I just start knitting. And there's a lot of ripping that happens as I do this because you think, oh, that's not quite what it's supposed to look like. And I rip it out and then I start again. And I want you to know this that I'm wearing. I started it, I made the center square and I realized after I started working on the arrows going out, Pythagorean theorem, that center square that's set on point it's two right triangles. This is the hypotenuse. And knowing how long these sides are told me how deep this was going to be too big able to finish the shawl going out. <laughs> I ripped out 11,000 stitches and I do not regret it. I, I did the math and I figured out it was at least 11,000 stitches, but that's just part of the creative process for me because I, I think better while I have knitting in my hands and you know I'll just be chewing on the idea while I'm knitting this is mostly garter stitch so I don't have to think about what I'm knitting I'm thinking about what it's going to be so that's that's really how I get there it's just trial and error I like to say I make the mistakes so you don't have to mm -hmm. yeah. yeah how do you do it what do you where do you start um well I tend to start with going to my stitch dictionaries and looking at stitch patterns. Um, usually I'll know, like I'll, I'll know I want to design whatever kind of shawl. It's usually a shawl, honestly. Of course <laughs> um, so I'll start with like, okay, I'm going to make a half pie shawl. And then, um, you know, maybe I'll have a rough idea of if I want it to be more geometric stitch pattern or something a little more floral or something. Um, and then I, do um and i don't know if this is partially just because um you know i have written some knitting books and so i kind of i had to work this way i write out the entire pattern and then knit it and then change if i need to change something like then i'll just like make notes and change so i pretty much will write out my entire pattern um probably like 90 percent of the time before i start knitting it um and when i do that it's i write the pattern out and then i start knitting and it's like Oh, this isn't going to work. <laughs> so yeah. I start over anyway. I do have that happen. Sometimes I was working on a shawl recently and I thought I wanted to knit it sideways and I started it. And I, I mean, and I, I had it written out enough, maybe not like a full pattern, but I had it like pretty much chart, right? out and I started knitting it and I'm just like, ew, no. <laughs> and so <laughs> I did then just rip it the whole thing out and then start over in a totally different shawl shape. So it does happen. It's not that like, oh, I just write the pattern and then I knit it. And, oh, it magically works every time. No, that's not the case. But I do tend to write, write out my patterns first and then knit from them. Um, but it, I'm always so interested because everyone does it a little different, you know, like some people will take a picture of a tree and then that will be their inspiration. I just, I tend to not work that way every once in a while I do, but not that often. Um, so I'm always, yeah, it's interesting how different people come up with their, with their patterns. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions coming in now. Kate would like to know, I struggle with holes in my knitting. How can I fix this? Any tips would be appreciated. Um, I would say it kind of depends on where your holes are. We kind of talked about this earlier. If it's something like socks or armholes, you could pick up extra stitches if that's like where you're getting the holes. Um, but what about if you have like holes like in the fabric itself? I guess that could just be, um, maybe not drawing through your, um, not drawing through your loop of your yarn or, um, making a that yarn over where you didn't mean to make one. Right. You know, if you're going from knit to purl or purl to knit and you um, don't move the yarn forward or back, then you end up with the yarn going over the needle when you make the next stitch. That's one way that it happens. Or if you're just doing plain knitting, like stockinette or garter, sometimes you don't get the yarn pulled all the way through before you drop the old stitch off. And that leaves you with a slipped stitch and the yarn over on your needle. And that means an increase that you'd need. If you notice it on the next row, you can fix that by just pulling it through and then working the stitch mm -hmm. if it belongs in the next row. But if you don't notice till 
oh, maybe 30 inches later, like I did on a poncho that I designed. No one's going to notice. You just sew it shut. Take a piece yes. of your yarn, go through the edges of the hole, tie a little half knot, work your ends in. Nobody's going to get so close that they can tell that something went wrong. But right. really, you should check your work every once in a while as you're knitting and try to catch those before 30 inches has gone by. Right. I'm yes. not going to rip out 30 inches of knitting to fix that one. It's just yeah, fine. I agree. Yeah. I'm not, I am not ripping out 30 inches of knitting. No, <laughs> definitely not. Well, you know, <laughs> most of the time, I mean, I'm not, there's always an exception, you know, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. We have a question from Pat. What do you think is the hardest thing to knit? The hardest thing. I think it really depends on you yeah. because it would be something that you don't like knitting. And I don't knit things that I don't like. Life mm -hmm. is too short to do knitting that you don't like. So if you don't like it, just find something else to do that you like better. Right. I agree. Like I like I want to say like a full length ferrile coat, but to some people that might not be hard because they they want to knit that. You know, it, it really is personal preference. Um, you know, some people hate lace. Some people hate cables, you know. So um, I would say like a lot of people are afraid of techniques like steaking where you're working a sweater um like a color work sweater and then you're cutting it down the middle to turn it into a cardigan. Um, I guess that's not necessarily hard, but that's sort of like a scary it's a leap technique. of faith. Yes. It's a leap of faith, which I'm working on a cardigan right now, which I've never done it before. And I'm just like, I'm just going to go for this and we'll see what happens. I've done it so. on little accessories, but I've not done it on an actual sweater. Yeah. I just, I'm going for it. I'm his fingering weight sweater and I'm just going to steak it and hope for the best. <laughs> How are you going to reinforce your steak? Are you going to crochet or machine stitch or what are you thinking? I think I'm going to, right now I feel like I'm going to mach machine stitch it to reinforce it, but to be determined. I mean, I've only knit about like this much of the sweater so far. So I have a while before I have to decide on that one. So <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Laura would like to know, is lace knitting difficult? I don't think so. But you know, it just depends on if you like it or not. Yeah, so I, all lace knitting is usually is increases and decreases. And the increases are just a yarn over. And the decreases might lean one way or the other to make that yarn over look super big and exciting. But you know, if you pick a simple lace pattern for your first lace project, usually you'll you'll have an even number of increases and decreases. For every increase, there's a decrease. And it's very obvious when you're doing it that this one's missing or not missing. And I think you should try it. That's the only way you're going to see if you like it. Yeah, I agree. Just give it a try. I don't think it's difficult either. I think that sometimes where people start to think that lace knitting is difficult is maybe because of the charts, because a lot of lace patterns use charts. Um, but a lot of patterns do include the written instructions for the charts, but, um, I don't really think that, yeah, I don't think lace knitting is hard. I would say just start with a pattern that has what looks like a small lace pattern. Like don't necessarily start with some huge shawl that like has like elaborate flowers and stuff that might be overwhelming to you, especially because both a chart and the written instructions are going to probably be a lot to take in if you're new to it. But if you just find something with cute little eyelets or a real simple little flower pattern, absolutely just give it a try. And we have some videos on the knitting circle um, on following charts and things like that if, you, if, if that is something you're interested in learning as well. And definitely pick something that has the actions, you know, the yarn overs and the knit two togethers or slip slip knits or whatever on just the right side. Don't pick your first lace pattern to be one with action on the wrong side also. That's a little more excitement than you really want for your first lace. But I want to show you this little little tiny flower pattern. Can you see those little flowers? Yeah, that's yeah, they're like a pattern like that rows. is perfect. Yeah, they're just over 6 rows and there's only 3 rows where you're doing something super simple. I would yeah. pick something like that. Yeah, I agree. Just, yeah, pick something simple and give it a try. And, I, you know, I mean, I know that this is kind of hard to sit, like hear, but the thing is, is at the end of the day, if you try it and you hate it and you rip it out, 
all you're left with is sticks and string. You know what I mean? Like, it's worth a try. And if you don't like it, I mean, yeah, I guess you spent a lot of time <laughs> knitting it to rip it out, but you know. <laughs> but then you get to enjoy that yarn all over again. And you liked it because you bought it, right? So... Right, exactly. Then you can use the yarn for something else. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see. Charlie has a question. Uh, super new to knitting and I'm running around the internet learning new words, the new knitting words. What do people mean when they say that they are frogging their knitting or what does frog your knitting mean? Rip it, rip it, rip it, rip it, rip it, rip it. Nope. <laughs> it's because you're ripping it out and it's ribbit. It sounds like a, the sound that a frog makes. There are, so, there's a lot of, there's a lot of words like that. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of them are the same for different crafts. I've sort of learned as I've gotten into other crafts, but yeah, there are sort of a lot of, Things we say as knitters, crocheters, crafters that, yeah, it's people are like what, frogging. Like, what does that have to do with knitting, you know? And tinking goes with that. Tinking, yes. which yes. is just the word knit spelled backwards. So when you're undoing something stitch by stitch, you're tinking. You're tinking it. Yep. Yep. I do a lot of that. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, Joan, oh, going back to tension, Joan has a question. Um, I have trouble in the beginning and once I get more comfortable, my knitting gets tighter. So any tips on how to, I guess, really keep the tension even as you go? I think that's just practice, practice, practice. Yes. And the other thing is make sure you're working on the fat part of the needle, not mm -hmm. just up at the tips. Needles come in different sizes to make different size fabric. Your gauge is going to be different. But if you do all your knitting on the little tiny tips, everything's going to be super tight. Yeah, that's really true, is it's very important that you make sure, and especially maybe as you're getting comfortable, if you start going faster, maybe you're not getting that, your stitches up to that fat part of the needle, like Michelle said. That's a really great tip. Um, let's see. Oh, Judy B says felted steak. I don't, I've never even heard of a felted steak. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> oh, have you, you done do it before? So I, I did it in a class recently. So you take, cool. you know, the needle felting tool, if you're yeah. making needle felted mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. on your steak, the area where you've got those extra stitches, you just over and over again. And you can tell by looking at the back that things are all fuzzed up. And that fabric is not going to fall apart. Those yarns are not going to come out. And then you can cut and everything's great. This is this is an idea for you, Jen, for your sweater. I just, I see, I've never heard of a felted steak before. That is, that's really cool. Well, maybe I'm going to do a felted steak now. We're going to have to see. Uh, let's see. Um, Joan says, love that pillow, uh, the pillow pattern. I think the one you showed earlier. Um, do you have a pattern on your website? So why don't you tell everybody um, maybe your website and where they can find some of your patterns? My website is pdxknitterati.com. I don't know if you can type that somewhere where it'll show up. I don't, does this, is it like, oh, yeah, a I probably can. Can. okay. So pdxknitterati.com and all of my patterns are listed there on the side, but it's a long list. So you can also find them on Ravelry. And if you look for pdxknitterati.com or Michelle Bernstein, either way, those will get you there. I also have patterns on pay hip. All of my shawls are there and all of my newer things. I'm trying to have more than one place where you can buy my patterns, mm -hmm. but not all of my patterns are on pay hip yet. It's a long process when you have more than 100 patterns to get them all listed somewhere else too. Eventually yes. they'll get there, but pay hip and Ravelry. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you just check out our website and then you'll be able to find that pillow pattern. Oh, and that one is called Snowy Woods Log Cabin Blocks. Okay, Snowy Woods Log Cabin Blocks. Yeah, that one's you really could pretty. Do a whole bunch of them and make a blanket and sew them together. That would be Ooh, beautiful. I knew that, that would someday. be really pretty. Yeah, yeah. someday I'm going to do that. Um, let's see here. The wool, the wool lady asks, what is the best way of joining a new ball of yarn? Or like, what do you do if you find a knot in your yarn? So how do you join a new yarn or what to do if you have a knot in your yarn? So I just start knitting with the new yarn mm -hmm. and leave the two tails hanging there. I'll tie a single overhand knot, like beginning to tie your shoes. And that's just to hold it there. And then when I knit back over it, I'll give it a little tug just to make sure the tension is right there. Then when I come back, when I'm done, I can either undo that little tiny knot, which I don't, or, and 
then so in the end. But I don't do anything special unless it's garter stitch. And I've used the yarn before and ripped out 11,000 stitches. And now my cuts are not in the right places. There is a knot called a magic knot that doesn't really show in garter stitch and it's very secure. So I use that one if it's going to be garter stitch or else, you know, like on the edge of a linen shawl, because I don't trust linen to not come apart because it's so stiff and wants to wiggle its way out. So magic knot, it's on my web page, on my tutorials page, pdxnitterati.com slash tutorials. I don't know if I did a magic knot for you guys or not. Yes, is you there... did. There, yep, there is a magic knot video that you did. Yep, yep. Yep. So very it's cool. It's a great knot. Yep. And I do the same thing. I either just simply start knitting with the new ball of yarn. Um, sometimes I will also actually knit the first, and I really only would do this along the edge of whatever I was making, probably a shawl. Um, I <laughs> sometimes will just knit um, the first stitch or two with both uh, the old yarn and new yarn held together. Um, and then leave my tails to weave in. Um, you just need to remember when you're coming back to those stitches on the next row that that's one stitch, not two, because there's two loops of yarn. Um, yes. I don't know. But really, either way works. It's just a matter of picking up the new yarn and starting. And yeah, if you like to have that simple overhand knot to secure it while you're still working, that's great too. Um, let's see. Lauren would like to know, yarn has gotten so expensive. Is there a place to purchase specialty yarns that won't break the bank? Well, I don't know. Um, no. um, I mean, yes, yarn can get very expensive. Yes, for sure. Um, a lot of times local yarn stores will have sales um, or a lot of them have all the time like a sort of bargain bin or sale bin. So sometimes you can find really great yarns for cheap that way. Um, and I, I personally think the yarns at the big box craft stores have gotten a lot better over the years. There's a lot more variety there. What do you think, Michelle? I think, yes. Um, my preference is always to support the little local stores that mm -hmm. I shop in here, but sometimes they don't have what I'm looking for. When I think about it though, and I know I'm I'm pretty lucky to be able to get yarn to make designs and have yarn support as a designer. But when I buy yarn, if I think about how many hours I'm going to knit with that yarn, it is really not expensive per hour or mm -hmm. per minute. So I might have to save up a little bit before I do the big splurge on a big project. But think about going to the movies. You could go to the movies. I don't even know how much a movie costs. I haven't been to one for so long. I know. No idea. You know, if you go to the movies twice, that could be a skein of yarn. And the movie's going to last me two hours, maybe three. But that skein of yarn is going to be good for me for weeks. So it's just a matter of deciding what you want to spend your money on. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there are, there are, you know, online um, retailers as well that you can find, you know, just by Googling. Um, some of them sometimes run some really great sales. Yeah. It's just, sometimes it is hard to find. I know like, you know, we all wish we could knit with a hundred percent cashmere all the time, but you know, for most of us, that's not a reality. Um, so yeah, yeah it's that's just not happening over here. <laughs> yeah. Not happening over here either. So um, you know, it's just really thinking about too, if you are going to, like Michelle said, spend the money on it, you know, maybe save up for something like really special that you like know you want to keep and maybe be an heirloom piece, you know, um, or, you know, save up to make something special like a sweater, but then maybe use some less expensive yarns for the hats you're knitting or socks or things like that. But yeah, exactly. it's because knitting, yeah, it can be a, it can be an expensive hobby. It doesn't have to be, but it definitely it can be. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Cheryl, this is an interesting question. Cheryl wants to know: Does yarn get old or go old? I found my grandmother's old yarn collection, and a few bundles have strong fibers that are not fuzzing or fraying. Um, and so she's hoping that we will give her good news. I would worry about moths. 
it depends yes is it yeah. acrylic or is it wool mm -hmm. but if you don't see broken things broken strands then i'm going to assume that yarn's okay i have had a yarn i don't know if it was because it was really tightly plied where you know you get these little curly bits but i had broken bits on that yarn and i don't know if it was a moth thing but i've never had better knock on wood here never had yeah. moths in my stash and so it might have just been because of the ply, but it was very clear that I couldn't use this yarn because it was breaking. Mm -hmm. If your grandmother's yarn isn't broken, I would just go ahead and knit with it. Yeah. Um, and I would say if you are, if it's wool or something and you are worried um, about moths, um, what a lot of people do is stick it in um, like a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag and throw it in the freezer for a while. So it kills anything that you know, because you don't, if there's moths in that yarn, you don't want the moths to get into your other yarn. So, right. um, but, and I've also read that you should do that as a cycle. So a freeze thaw cycle a couple of yeah. times, mm -hmm. because if you just freeze them once, it's like they've had a hard winter and then they come out in the next spring, but if you give them a couple of good whacks in the freezer. That would yeah. be a good thing to do. Plus, I mean, who just doesn't want to have yarn in their freezer? <laughs> well, I have a very tiny freezer, so there's yeah. not much room for not, yarn. Not, not much room to store your yarn in there. Um, Sharon wants, but yeah, I would, just going back to that real quick. Yeah, I would say if it looks strong, if there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it, yeah, go ahead and knit with it. I, I hope you make something cool. That sounds, I mean, what that, what a great find. <laughs> yeah, and an heirloom. Yeah, really. Um Sharon would like to know if we have brioche instructions avail available. So Michelle has a lot of brioche patterns, um, which you could find on her website, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and Michelle has tutorials um, for some brioche on her website. And we have um, some tutorials as well on the knitting circle for brioche. So I think that answers that one. Um, and you do all the all the different kinds of brioche, right, Michelle? Because there's different all different kinds of brioche, right? Yes, syncopated and increases and decreases, and I don't know what I'm going to find next, but there'll be more. <laughs> yeah, th yeah. There's always more to discover. That's the fun thing about knitting is I feel like you can knit for your whole life, and you can always be learning something new. There's so many different techniques to try. Oh, so good. I have had such a good time teaching online this year. I mean, pandemic, awful, right? Mm -hmm. But it has really made classes so much more accessible for people, people who either couldn't travel because of physical limitations or maybe financial limitations. It's been a great leveling. And, you know, I teach on, on Zoom and you can see my hands. Everybody can see my hands at the same time. So I... I don't even know where I started this. <laughs> what was the question? Um, I th we were just talking about brioche and all the different things you can do in knitting in general. Yeah. Oh, and what I what I wanted to say is that people from all levels of knitting come to these classes and they all go away knowing something new. And I think that knowing something new is just kind of what makes my heart go pity pat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean... I think like, obviously, all of us are looking forward to having our in person knitting events again, right? I mean, we love them. But I think that like zoom instruction as far as like, whether yarn stores are running classes, even just different conventions or groups doing things online, I, I do think it's here to stay because it does make it easier for a lot of people. And I, I do love that Everybody can see your hands at the same time. It does make it a lot easier to teach, especially some of those trickier things like brioche, you know, like everybody can see exactly what you're doing for sure. Um, let's see, we have time for just a couple more questions and we have one for, from Mary. Mary would love to knit a cart, uh, would love to knit a cardigan. And in fact, she's already purchased her yarn um, but she's intimidated about the sleeves. Do you have an easy pattern to follow? Um, we don't, there are a few sweater patterns on um, the Knitting Circle website, um, but what, the sweater pattern I'm thinking right off the bat, again, going back to Tin Can Knits is um, the sweater pattern called Harvest. Um, I, I know that that's a cardigan. It just has one, I think one button you put in the center, but I, I, right off the bat, that's like easy sweater pattern, to, cardigan pattern to follow. 
How about you, Michelle? Do you have anyone off the top of your head? Do you knit a lot of cardigans? You knit mostly like um like just top down pullovers, yeah, right? I, mostly pullovers because I I used to knit cardigans and then I realized I wasn't wearing them because I like my shirts to be kind of long mm -hmm. and I'm short on top. So I'd have to tuck in my shirt in order to wear the cardigan. And that is not a good look on me. So all of my sweaters are pullovers and they're a little bit cropped and they work mm -hmm. out really well for me. Yeah. Sorry about the cardigans. But what is what is holding you up on the sleeve? Question asker. Is it because it's in the round or is it flat and you have to seam it? What is your sticking point? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd like to know that too. Also, if you're intimidated by the sleeves, you could just make it short sleeve. <laughs> yeah. You know, so <laughs> I mean, I, that's like this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually, I'm somebody that's warm all the time. I pretty much don't knit a long sleeve sweater. I would, any sweater that's long sleeve, I'm probably gonna make it short sleeve. So um, yeah, but let us know what your holdup was with the sleeves and maybe we can give you some tips. Let's see, got a couple more questions here. Um, Angie wants to know, can you combine other crafts with knitting? Just stubble, stumbled um, upon this, but um, Angie's into punch needle, cross stitch, and I'm always looking for other crafts to dabble in. Yeah, I mean, I think you can combine knitting with other crafts. What do you think, Michelle? I absolutely think so. You can embroider on your on your stockinette stitch. You can either use duplicate stitch or you could cross stitch on it. Mm -hmm. um, your stitch is a little taller than it is wide. So you have to make sure that you're gonna be able to cover your stitches. I know you can put crocheted edgings on almost anything and that looks great. Just a little bit of embellishment. You can add beads to your knitting, which is, that used to be my favorite thing until I found brioche. <laughs> but yes, you can add a lot of different things. Yeah, I agree with that. Um... We have some videos on the knitting circle for um, how to embroider onto your knitting. So if you do like to do things like cross stitch, you might find that very enjoyable. And there's some really, really cool things that you can do with the embroidery on your knitting. And yeah, I love, I love adding crochet. Even sometimes if I'm making like a blanket, even just crocheting a border around it. Yeah, you can combine knitting with all kinds of stuff. Um, Cheryl says that Miss Michelle is a fantastic teacher, super patient. So apparently Cheryl's been in one of your classes before. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Yeah. Oh, here's Mary, um, asking the, she's the one that asked the question about the sweater for the sleeves. Um, worried about the underarm and connecting it so that it's not too tight. So... I think the main thing is that you need to make sure sort of you're knitting the right side, like make sure that you're the size you're making that the um, armhole is going to be right for your body. Um, Cause I know for me sometimes um, like this, the size sweater I need for like my bust measurement, sometimes the sleeve actually isn't like big enough, like it will be too tight. And so in that case, I just will pick up sometimes extra stitches under the arm or, um, cause usually when I'm making the sleeves are pretty plain, I can just kind of, you know, fudge it and add some more stitches in. Um, but yeah, just don't be afraid to try it. Um, and if you need to pick up a few extra stitches, um, you know, in the underarm, that's totally fine. Um, okay, so I think that that is it as far as, uh, questions go. Uh, Michelle, before we go, do you have any uh, final words for our, uh, for all of our viewers? I think what I want you to remember is that as long as you get the result you want, you're doing it right. This is fun. It's for you. And it's here to give us pleasure and joy. And again, life is too short to knit something you don't like. So if you don't like your project, rip it out. Use the yarn for something else. Yep. I think that's a great tip. Perfect way to end. Um, so I just wanted to thank Michelle for joining me today. I loved having you here and getting to chat with you over Zoom. Hopefully we can see each other in person <laughs> sometime soon. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to thank all of you viewers for watching us here today. Um, if you did enjoy watching this Q&A, we do them every month. So make sure that you're subscribed to our newsletter and also be sure to like us on Facebook so that you'll know when we have the next one. Um, we'll have another one uh, next month in May with um, another knitting expert from the Knitting Circle. And don't forget, if you didn't already download the free pattern for this month, the Waffle Stitch Infinity Scarf, 
make sure that you go ahead and click that link um, on the page where you're watching this video and get that so you can knit one from your, for yourself. Um, so thanks everybody for watching. I hope that you have a great day. Happy knitting and I'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks for having me.